No data tonight. No data. This is going to be thoughts. Big, kind of big picture thinking, and it's because I read this book by this woman, Ruth DeFries. I happened to meet her. Um, she wrote this book. It's called The Big Ratchet, How Humanity Thrives in the Face of Natural Crisis. And um, it's a, uh, I was going to say it's a good book. It didn't, I, I wanted her to do more in the book. I wanted her to go farther than she did. But what happened when I was reading the book was I, I reinterpreted the whole thing in terms of bees. <laughs> Okay, so what it did is stimulate me to think about her theme, but in terms of bees. And as uh, Mia was just saying, the thesis of this book is this, the ratchet, the hatchet, and the pivot. And she shows in very good detail throughout evolutionary history, and then human history, and then agricultural history, this is the pattern of life, basically. And it was when she got to the agricultural history is when I went, okay, this is what's happening with the bees right now. So what this means is there's periods of time where things ratchet up. In evolutionary time, it was you know rapid speciation until you get, for example, dinosaurs. And then there's a big extinction event, and that's the hatchet. And then after that extinction event, there's a pivot when there's new opportunities because the in the niche occupied by the dinosaurs, for example, is no longer there, and so other organisms have opportunities. So that's an example throughout evolution, one that you'll probably relate to or understand. Humanity does the same thing, and agriculture does the same thing. So let me give you some examples of that. It really began, the ratchet in agriculture began with the Green Revolution, which is really interesting to me because Norman Borlaug is the father of the Green Revolution, and he was from Minnesota, and his building was two buildings down from where the entomology building is where I work. And Norman Borlaug was a plant breeder. He was a good guy. There's nothing wrong with what he was trying to do, okay? First of all, don't diss this guy. He was a good guy. He was a plant breeder, and his idea was to, to breed varieties of wheat and varieties of rice that you could grow very intensely and, and feed people. So his, his goal was to feed people, particularly in underdeveloped c countries, nations, like Mexico and India. So he took his wheat variety down to Mexico and he started growing it there. And the, all you need to see is the line going up on whatever you're left. And wheat production went up when he started growing his varieties in this intensive way. And when he took rice to India, they started increasing rice production for food for these people. And this was all good. Except that this good idea then, as we do as humans, and as apparently nature tends to do also, it ratchets. It ratchets. And here we are. So then you take this intensive production of a crop, and you expand it to a level where it's not sustainable anywhere. And this is, this is true. This is Minnesota. This is where I live. I don't live there. I, don't live there. I live in the Twin Cities. But this is the state I live in. Much of it looks like this, unfortunately. It's wall-to-wall -wall corn. And so that's an example of taking something to an extreme. So now it's not actually, of course, feeding people. It's feeding livestock or feeding cars. But it's an example of a ratchet. Another ratchet are lawns. This is two doors down from where I live. Um, my lawn is a, a, a native prairie, so it's different from this lawn. And, um, but this is another example how we seem to want a single species growing. There's something about it in the last 60 years that we find aesthetically pleasing. Maybe it's control issues that we have. I really don't understand um, what is behind this. I don't find it aesthetic myself, but it has been in our culture that this is, this is, this is desirable. Now, if you're playing soccer on this, if you've got a lot of kids, this is desirable. But for places where you're not walking, it's not necessarily. But it's an example of, again, this ratchet in taking a good thing like this lawn and then making it so extensive and so in, in intensive, input intensive, 
that it's ratcheted up to extreme levels. Almonds are another ratchet, taking a food crop and producing it in excess in one area. And of course, you know more about this, lots of water and it's just another ratchet, a monocrop. So now this is, those are examples of ratchets and then here's my spin on what Ruth was talking about and I don't know if Ruth would like this spin or not, but this is now me speaking, not Ruth, okay. Um, that rat, the ratchet, the increase in production of almonds, for ex in, actually, the increase in production of almonds is driving this kind of beekeeping. This is what's driving it. It's because beekeepers then need to move their bees across the nation to pollinate this one crop that blooms here at the end of February, early March. And so to respond to the increase in almond production and the increase in the grower demand for colonies to be really strong at the end of February, Beekeepers really need to pump their colonies full of artificial feed. And so they're feeding sugar syrup, sometimes corn syrup, now more sugar syrup, and pollen substitute, which neither of which are based on anything that bees eat naturally in their natural diet. Okay. There's been a ratchet in insecticide use, not so much the number of insecticides, because the EPA regulates how many insecticides, but the, there is a wide diversity of insecticide use, um, all these different classes of insecticides, and I won't go into the neonics right now, but we can, I'll leave time for a lot of questions if you have questions about those. But there has been an increase in the use of insecticides and this idea that it's kind of like chemotherapy in our environment. So, if we're going to get rid of something, we're going to get really wholesale, get rid of it. You know, we're just going to wipe out the whole continent of that particular bug instead of controlling the bug where it is or when it's at a level that's problematic. Herbicides are really, in Minnesota and the upper Midwest and lots of the Corn Belt area of the United States and probably everywhere actually, herbicides are a huge ratchet right now. We talk about insecticides. Herbicides are the issue. Herbicides, you know, with the Roundup Ready crops that we have, that a genetic modification that allows the plant, like um, the soybeans or alfalfa, to withstand herbicide, so that you can spray lots of herbicide to kill off the weeds around it, and that plant will continue to grow. And so what that means is that everywhere around it, there's absolutely no flowering plants or weedy plants. And so this is, for me, this is a much bigger problem than some of the insecticide use because all the flowering plants that bees need for survival are being sprayed. This is in ag agriculture and in home use. Okay, so that's just brief examples of ratcheting up. And when you ratchet, there's always a correction. There's always a correction. And think about, I mean, this is, happens over and over. It happens with economics, 2008, 2009 in the United States, there's a big correction. <laughs> there's corrections maybe in your own personal habits and your, maybe your weight, where you, you reach, you ratchet up and then you go, okay, I got, okay, we gotta do something about this. So the, these kind of corrections happen all the time. And so hatchets are corrections. And we're undergoing a big one, big one right now. And it's really kind of cool. But for bees, actually the hatchet happened a long time ago. Bees are in the news now, we're paying attention, but the hatchet for bees happened when we changed agricultural practices. And I talk about this a lot, just the loss of number of bees since World War II, since we changed our agricultural practices. Another hatchet for bees happened in the 80s when Varroa was introduced inadvertently from Asia, this parasitic mite lives only on honeybee colonies, within honeybee colonies, sucks their blood, weakens them, is a huge problem. Huge problem for bees. Very difficult to control. That was a big hatchet on their honeybee populations and it still is. The original solution in the 80s and early 90s when the mites came in was immediately put synthetic pesticides in the colony and that led to another big ratchet, hatchet right away, boom, boom, because the mites develop in, uh, resistance to those kind of insecticides very quickly. And so now we have a hatchet because there's no control, because those 
those substances that we are applying weren't, aren't working anymore. In 2006, 2007, when colony collapse disorder, whatever that really is, came on the scene, we knew that it was something more than Varroa because we'd had Varroa and we've had those problems for a very long time. So that was another hatchet on, in the, for the bee population, but we really still don't know, understand what caused that original rapid loss of bees from colonies. We still don't understand what it is. What we know now is that it's due to many causes and I'll get back to that. Well, I guess I'll get to it right now. <laughs> this is a slide I use often to show that bees are dying from many, many, many causes. And each one of these acts individually. Sometimes they act, act in concert. Sometimes they act synergistically or sometimes simultaneously. But we know each of these things, varroa mites, diseases, pesticides, in-hive miticides, a flowerless landscape, a monoculture, with no flowers. Actually, the two things at the bottom are basically the same, depending on the monoculture. But all of these things individually can kill bees. And when you start putting them in combination, sometimes they can be really lethal. But are, are any of these the cause of death of colonies throughout the United States? No. So identifying one single cause of the big hatchet or the problem with bees is very, very difficult. And I would say the best way to describe what's going on for our bees right now, especially where I live, I don't know about here so much, and this is a quote from Zach Browning, who's a commercial beekeeper from North Dakota. He says, honeybees, wild bees, and our other pollinators like monarchs and others are reduced to feeding on scraps. And that's a really sad state of affairs if if, they're, if our bees can't find food out there. And in my area, in Minnesota, it used to be, it is, still is one of the top honey producing states in the nation, but they are, bees have to look far and wide for scraps, for places where there's flowers in bloom that aren't killed with herbicide, that may not be contaminated with insecticide, that are good for them. Our nesting sites for our wild bees, because we have thousands of species of wild bees in the United States. Minnesota has over 400 species of native bees, and we're starting to do surveys. Our state, Minnesota, is really, really passing a lot of legislation right now. Actually, sorry, I'm in the pivot part. Let me go back to the hatchet, sorry. Got to help myself. I can't, I don't stay very long in a pessimistic place. So. <clears throat> okay, back to the, the crap, okay. <laughs> Nesting sites for our, our wild bees, and there are many thousand species of them, are either plowed over or paved over. Many of our native bees live in stems. We cut down, we trim, we like, this, we like that clean aesthetic in our landscape. And, and so our native bees are suffering mostly from lack of food and also insecticide and herbicide use, but also lack of places to build a house. So our honeybees are okay. They have, we provide them nesting sites, our boxes. But the native bees, we either mulch over everything where they are, or we trim down all the stems so that they don't have anything to put their nest in. And we try to manicure it enough so that we're just making it habitable for one single species, which is us, rather than allowing other species to cohabitate our environment where we live. So really, what's happening right now, I think, is a big hatchet on the Green Revolution concept. And it wasn't a bad concept, it was just, it was a great idea, but it was just taken too far. And there's a big correction happening right now. And it, I think a lot of it started with the loss of bees in 2006, 2007. Even though the bees had been dying for many years, just bringing this to the public's attention has made people really start to think about our landscape in a new way. And I would say here in particular and many other parts of the United States and definitely in Minnesota, there's really a cultural revolution happening in the way we think about our landscapes. So that idea of that single species manicured lawn or monocrop 
is starting to shatter around the edges. And people are thinking, okay, maybe, maybe it looks okay, <laughs> a little messier. So this is, in my mind, it's a good correction because we're gonna let other species in when that happens. Okay, so when there's, after there's a correction, in, in Ruth's book, she talks about the pivot. And in human terms, it's a place of incredible ingenuity. It's where creativity happens. And it's, in terms of animals and speciation and plants, it's a time when there's a lot of um, rapid development and what in, in science we call plasticity, where a lot of options start to happen. And you get a wide variety of new new evolution, new, new species develop, and in human terms, new ideas. So this is where we're at, and yeah, this is where we're at. We're at the big pivot. And the pivot for bees, of course, is the increase in public awareness. When did bees ever make the cover of Time magazine? When did places start marketing what, what your world would look like if there were no bees? When did the false Einstein quote start making such a prominence throughout the literature and the, our, our awareness? Our awareness about native bees increased. So in many places, people thought about honeybees, but no one was really thinking about our native bees. Now, all of a sudden, everybody is, not all of a sudden, but finally, people are starting to think about our native bees and the importance they also play in pollination, in plant reproduction, and just the importance of having all this diversity of all these different families of bees out there in our ecosystem. And that they're beautiful little bees, and they don't necessarily produce honey, they don't produce honey, but we really need them out there to pollinate our plants. The, a, a big pivot's happening around nutrition. And it kind of parallels the local food movement. They're kind of going hand in hand. So as we want, just like this says, as we want good, clean food, as people want good, clean food, I would say so do the bees. And we want our food labeled. We want to know what's in our food. We want to know where it's from. We would prefer, if we could, to eat food produced locally. We can't always do that but it's something desirable, and we want to know if it's gluten-free, if it's organic, if it's, G and has, if it's GMO, if it's not GMO. We want to know everything. And I would argue that the bees would like a little bit of that food labeling, too. <laughs> and, but actually, bees are really good at going to a flower and determining the quality of the nutritive quality of the pollen and the nectar from that flower. They can do it through sense of smell. They can do it through taste. They get lots of information from the flower about the quality of that resource. I think they would like a little pesticide labeling on that plant, if possible. But this understanding that just like we want to know what's in our food and that we need good food, people are starting to understand that bees need good food too. And their food comes as flowers. And the food that they need is nectar and pollen. And it was a great day for me when I went to the national entomology meetings. And uh, I'll call her out by name. It was a Dr. Gloria DeGrandy Hoffman, who's from the research leader at the Tucson lab, stood in front of a national audience of researchers and said she was the one who really pushed for the development of Megabee. It's a pollen substitute. And now she realizes it's just junk food for bees. In fact, all of the pollen subs are pretty much junk food for bees. It's soybean flour, brewer's yeast. It's not food that's in their natural diet. And someone from the, I about fell over when I heard this from her. And, um, but happy and proud that she did it. I was like, yes, you're, that's awesome. And then someone from the audience said, well, if, if the pollen sub is not good for them, what about high fructose corn syrup or sugar syrup for them? And she said, yeah, it's, that would be kind of like after tossing down an Oreo, you have a Coca-Cola. <laughs> so, so this realization on lots of levels and, and at the top of the research that we need to be developing, if we, there are times of the year when you do need to feed bees. 
and when we get new bees into Minnesota, there's times of the year we have to feed a little bit. And can't we develop a food that's more closely re resembles nectar or pollen? Why do we need to develop? They have honey, just save it and give them back. You can, you can freeze the pollen and feed it back. Yes, you can. Um, in our case, a lot of it's very contaminated with insecticide. So, <laughs> but I was really happy another time when I saw Purina um, advertise a job for somebody to develop a bee food, and I was thinking, well, I wonder if they could really do this thing right. You know, if they could really develop a bee food that's really has pollen in it, or something that's really derived from food substances that the bees actually eat. But anyway, this big pivot in bee nutrition is happening now, and expect a lot of good research because it's it's on everybody's plate. Everybody's thinking about this thing. And I would argue that nutrition is at the base of this big puzzle of interactions and problems that the bees have. And I'm going to talk more about it at, in Davis when I go up to the whatever event that is. <laughs> I forget the name of it. Symposium. Symposium, thank you. But when bees have good nutrition, and I'll explain how this works there, but when bees have really good nutrition, they are able to detoxify pesticides. Bees have enzymes that can detoxify. And when they have a lot of protein, they produce, with some of this protein, they produce the enzymes that can break down metabolized pesticides. And when they have really good nutrition, it bolsters their immune system. They can make the proteins that they need to stimulate their immune system because the immune systems for bees is mostly made out of proteins and when they have good proteins then their immune systems are functioning good nutrition helps with viruses it helps it helps them it doesn't necessarily help with varroa mites that's a whole different set of problem so i want to i'll get back to that in a minute we do need in this pivot that we're happening that's happening right now we do need to come up with better ways to control Varroa because the model of just trying an insecticide or a miticide one right after another hasn't worked. It clearly hasn't worked since 1987. It's, it's not working. So this is, we need to find new ways to do this. And we also cannot underestimate the value of the bees' own self-defenses, what they can do to keep themselves healthy because they're quite good at it when they're not overwhelmed with mites or overwhelmed with an insecticide or, or no flowers out there. When the environment's fairly good, uh, like you have going on here in this area, then the bees' own self-defenses can kick in. And they're quite remarkable. So things like the hygienic behavior, the ability to uh, detect disease brood and throw it out of the nest, weed it out of the colony, the ability to bring in lots of resin that has a lot of antimicrobial properties, um, grooming behavior, even venom. Did you know that venom is antimicrobial? Some bees spread venom on their cuticle and that helps them disinfect. I mean, they have things that they're doing that we're just tip of the iceberg in what we're trying to, what we're starting to understand about all the glandular secretions and all of the things that bees do at, to sterilize themselves and their colony. And it's not just our honeybees, because the native bees have all these defenses, to, defenses too, that are quite amazing. Yeah. A big pivot that we need to do that I hope is happening is how we can do, how we can have our pollinators and pesticides. So this is not an either or question. It's not get rid of all the pesticides or get rid of all the pollinators. We, in agriculture, and there are times when you need to control a pest. What we need to do is figure out ways where we can control pests where we can also maintain pollinators. Because what we're doing right now, as I explained, is like this chemotherapy where we're trying to eliminate all the pests everywhere all the time and it doesn't allow our pollinators to thrive. There are ways to do this thing where it's more precision. There's, it's precision, the, the way the pesticide, the insecticide, or even the 
herbicide is applied is done with precision, so it's just getting the insect and not everything else around it. That's what they tried to do with the neonicotinoids. They tried to localize it within the plant. The problem is, is that it's too persistent within the plant. Right. So they localized it, but now it's like in there for a very long time. So that creates another problem. I think we can do this thing. I have a lot of faith that if we keep the pressure up and the awareness up about bees and pollinators, that I think the chemical companies are going to have to come up with ways to apply insecticides and herbicides in ways that aren't so devastating to so many other insects. So from where I sit in the upper Midwest, there's some really cool pivots happening right now. And one of them is coming out of Iowa. Iowa State University has this project called the Strips Project, and they're putting in these buffer strips, flowering native prairie buffer strips between corn, and in this case, between corn and corn or corn and soybeans. In Minnesota, they want to do it between a crop and a waterway because we have a lot of water, a lot of lakes, a lot of rivers, a lot of ponds and um, ditches. But in the Strips Project, what they found is this concept that I'll call, and maybe it's not my term, but it's called stacked benefits. So when you start putting in flowering strips like this, what happens is then you prevent soil erosion and you keep the nitrogen in the soil instead of having it run off the field. And then the root structure on the native prairie plants is very deep, takes a long time to establish, but when it does, it starts it helps with that soil erosion and the nitrogen runoff, but it also then starts flowering and benefits pollinators. It brings in beneficial insects that then start a, um, controlling the insect pests in the corn and the soybean. And then it brings in songbirds. It brings in game birds for hunting. And it has, that's what we call stack benefits. It, if you put this near waterways, it increases the, um, the, the quality of the water. So it just has so many benefits. And then when they started looking at the yield of farmers that would put in these strips, their yields were increasing. Maybe because they were only growing the corn on land where it's actually profitable <laughs> instead of on marginal lands where they weren't re really getting a very good yield. So there were so many benefits from things like these strips, these flowering strips, a great way to diversify the environment. In Minnesota, they passed legislation that when you're restoring a prairie, because they're restoring quite a few prairies around Minnesota now, especially in western Minnesota, they must put in more flowering plants, especially in early spring. It's mandated. So any our all state uh, managed lands, when they restore prairie, they, they tell them, you must put in more flowering species for the pollinators. There are federal mandates now and federal incentives now to put in cover crops in the upper Midwest, in Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and the Dakotas. So if you're a farmer in certain conditions, it's not a lot of money and it's, the conditions are kind of stringent, but you can get money to put in flowering cover crops, clover cover crops for bees and to help remediate the soil, to fix nitrogen in the soil. And there's incentives to do this. And, it, and it's been really successful. And within a f just a few months, they, they used up all the incentives. People jumped all over this. And so we, we need more of these. We need people to go, yes, this is a good thing. We want more. And they're starting to do it. Our roadsides in Minnesota are starting to change. Our Department of Transportation is starting to plant more native species on our roadsides. This is a really good thing because it, pro it provides corridors for bees. This one's right in the middle of Twin Cities, not far from where I live. In the middle of the city, um, this is I-94, major, major interstate going um, east and west. And it's full of, you know what the red flower is? Milkweed? It's milkweed, <laughs> which is what monarchs need, right? correct. So that the Department of Transportation, at least in Minnesota, and definitely in Iowa, because they have a trust fund to plant flowers 
on their highways in Iowa. We don't have that in Minnesota. But they're starting to realize, yeah, this will this is a good thing. It beautifies the roadside and it it benefits our pollinators. We're doing research. I have a student, um, Ian Lane, who's doing research on flowering lawns. And this was an amazing thing. It, it started because I was I ride my bike around a lot in the Twin Cities, and I one day after I got home, I just went, I am so sick of lawns, I'm gonna pop. I could, I could, I reached my limit on lawns. I burned off my own lawn that year <laughs> and got a citation. But anyway, um, I wrote. Our lottery money in the state of Minnesota goes into a trust fund, and it's the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. And you, anybody, can apply for a grant from this trust fund to do any prairie restoration, land, even land <coughs> acquisition, um, education, research, for many different reasons. I mean, it's hard to get the money. It's not an easy grant proposal, and it's not an pro easy process to get the money. But I pitched a proposal that we need fl more flowering lawns, and, and they funded it. So this is Ian Lane, and what we're doing is that the lawn there has white Dutch clover on it. So probably growing up, you remember maybe lawns with white clover in it, or Dutch clover. They don't sell, and you buy sod, you won't get that anymore. And if you buy lawn seed, you won't get Dutch clover in your lawn seed anymore. But it's still there in places. It's a great bee plant. It's a great bee plant. But we're trying to find native species that you can seed into. And we're not using Kentucky bluegrass. We're using a hard fescue, which is a northern adapted turf. Grows great in Minnesota. You just can't buy it anywhere. <laughs> And it requires a lot less water, a lot less mowing. It looks fine as a lawn. It looks great. So we're starting with a hard fescue lawn, and we're seeding in different these native flowers. Some of them I've kind of pasted the picture of the natives. And it's hard to find natives that will withstand the mowing and continue to bloom. But we have three or four species that we think will do it. We, so this is our... This summer we'll figure it out because these native species, again, take long to um, establish. This is the second year, and so they will flower this year. So we'll see if they can withstand the mowing and continue to bloom. And that's the hope, is that we can find more native species to put in our, our lawns. And actually, I think what it would take more than the research on the flowers is a little bit of <laughs> changing the lawnmower industry. Yeah. Because lawnmowers, a push mower, the highest you can get it is three inches. And a power mower you can take to four inches. But if we could have a six inch lawn, do you know how many flowers we could have in a six inch lawn <laughs> that we could mow? So who runs the lawnmower industry? <laughs> I, need to, I need to meet this person. <laughs> So those, that I just wanted to do this briefly for you. This is what I think about a lot, is how evolution works, how humanity works, how things ratchet up, how corrections happen, and then this pivot point that we go through where there's a lot of ingenuity. And I think about this a lot, so I bring the book back up in case you wanted to read it. I will say she doesn't stay in the pivot point long enough for me. <laughs> but it's still provocative and makes me think. Can you have a question and then uh, I'm going to go I actually on. was going to say that the way that you would get a six inch lawnmower is just make the wheels bigger. It'll raise it up. Get bigger wheels. Yeah. And you can change them. That's <laughs> true. That's true. That's good thinking. <laughs> that was good pivot. Um, I want to talk about Varroa just a little bit. I'm going to go back to this because nutrition helps bees on a lot of levels, but it, it does not help them necessarily with a Varroa mite. So I just have a few slides here to tell you some stuff that I've been thinking about. But actually, um, Bonnie and Gary and many of you here, um, the woman that I talked to at dinner from San Mateo, 
Nikki. 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 There, she's sitting right in front of me, sorry. A lot of people are already thinking about this here, so you ought to really listen to what they're saying because they're way far ahead. But this is, this is what they're doing, but from my way of thinking about it. So, of course, everybody's familiar with the life cycle of Varroa. It's super important that you understand this pest. Everybody understand the parasite. It rides around on the adult bee, crawls into a cell containing a larva. When the cell is sealed and the larva begins to pupate, that mite begins feeding and reproducing. It weakens the developing bee. It's like its mouth parts are like a dirty syringe, a dirty needle, where it'll pick up virus from the bee and then amplify it within the mite and spread out spread around the virus so the bees weakened. They carry more virus, and it becomes this big downward spiral. How many of you are you familiar with this concept of herd immunity? Okay. So here, here it is. So there's one guy in the, most of the people that are blue on the left-hand side have not been vaccinated. This is the human analogy, this is the human example of herd immunity. They have not been vaccinated. The people in yellow did get their vaccinations for whatever issue. Guy in red, it's always a guy, right? No. The person in red <laughs> has some con highly contagious disease and comes into this population. And, and then what happens on the right here? Everybody in blue becomes infected, they become red. And the people in yellow didn't become infected because they were vaccinated, okay? So, but if most people get vaccinated here, so now most of the, the yellow people have all been vaccinated except for these three people, and then this contagion comes into the population. Now, the only one that got it, where's my pointer, here it is, was this guy, this one, that was not vaccinated. So if only some get vaccinated, the virus spreads. But if most get vaccinated, the spreading is contained. Now, how does this pertain to bees? It pertains in two ways. And you guys are doing the second way, but most people need to do the first way. And I'll explain what I mean. So herd immunity for bees using treatments is if only some colonies are treated, varroa and viruses spread like crazy. It's called horizontal transmission and it gets out of control. And when mites are able to move between colonies, they become much more virulent, and the viruses become much more virulent along with it. And the only way to contain this is if most or sufficient number of colonies in one area get treated, you bring the mite levels down, it's like enough colonies being vaccinated, they're not vaccinated, they're just bringing the mite levels down, spreading can be contained. And unfortunately, in the United States, we're at this level. Not enough people are really controlling the mites. The commercial guys are controlling their mites. Unfortunately, in many areas, a lot of people don't want to control the mites. And when that happens, we end up with a lot of dead colonies and a lot of horizontal transmission. Now, another way around it, which is what you're doing here, is local breeding programs for bees that survive. And it's exactly the same concept with or without treatments. But in this case, if, if you have a local population and, the beekeep and other beekeepers bring in lots of infested colonies, lots of mites in them, or they allow their colonies to have really high mite levels, then varroa and viruses spread like crazy, just like in the other one. It's that horizontal transmission that selects for increased virulence. But if, if the infested colonies are allowed to die off, and fewer colonies are introduced from outside, or, and, or fewer colonies are allowed to have higher mite levels, in other words, there is some treatments happening, maybe, then you can, you can contain the spread of the mites, the horizontal transmission of the mites. And this is what's happening here, is that if you, if you can reduce the number of outside bees coming in, and you get your mite populations low, then what happens is the spread is contained and the self-defenses of the bees kick in. Right, Bonnie, Gary? This is what you're seeing in these bees here. And it, it's kind of cool to watch. 
It's, it's really neat to see bees able to withstand the mites on their own. And of course, not all of them will be able to do it. There will be colonies that collapse from mites. But if at a population level or a community level, a regional, local level, you're able to get an, the mite population down low enough in a sufficient number of colonies, the bees' defenses will kick in. They just can't do it when they're overwhelmed with mites. They can't do it. Nobody can. No organism can. How fast does it happen? Five years. <laughs> Takes a while. It's not a fast thing. So without treatments and or local breeding efforts, the mites gain the upper hand. And this is really happening in Minnesota. I mean, it's really, it, local breeding programs are, there are some in Michigan, there are good ones in Pennsylvania, there's a number of them on the East Coast, but Minnesota doesn't have really good local breed uh, programs, and a lot of it's because we have a lot of commercial beekeepers move bees in, take bees out. We have a lot of movement of, of bee colonies and mites, and um, a lot of local beekeepers who refuse to treat or do anything for their mites. So mite levels get really high, really fast in our area. So when I'm done with the projects that I'm working on now, I'm hoping within a year or two I can get back into the bee breeding part of what I was doing before and um, start kind of like what you guys are doing here. But it's going to be a, a difficult project in Minnesota, but maybe I'll follow your examples. I'll hire you guys out. To come. Yeah. So um, in this, I'm going to end on a couple of slides here with our bee squad. So this is a program I started within my lab. It's actually a business that runs from within my lab called the bee squad. And um, this is Becky Masterman on the upper right. She was my first graduate student. She has a PhD and then she went into real estate and now she's running my bee squad. So she's got a business background and a bee background and she's really high energy and really creative. And what the photo you're looking at is keeping bees on rooftops in the city. This is Minneapolis Institute of Art as one of our locations. And the reason we do this is just to raise awareness about landscaping. So people think that they can help bees by being a beekeeper. And there's a lot of problems with that logic. <laughs> That's not necessarily true. If you want to help bees, you plant flowers, you give them food. That, that, that helps bees or you, you don't treat flowers with insecticides or kill them with herbicides, that helps bees. So what we do is put bees in certain locations strategically so that we are hoping that certain places, certain places change their landscaping practices. But before I get to that part, what Becky's doing right now is she's coming up with a mite sampling kit. It's a mite check kit. And so she'll sell it we'll sell it and it's a little bucket and it has everything you need in it to do the sugar roll test to see if your colonies have mites and so along with that we'll start we're working with other people that we can set up an anonymous well a web page but you can anonymously enter your data so that you can see what your mite levels are relative to other people in your area you can see if when people treated or what they were doing what their mite levels were like It'd be awesome if you guys from Marin County, San Mateo, you could show what your colonies are doing and what the, their mite levels are like and show that you're not using treatments. And so we could have this information about what people's mite levels are like nationwide. And if it's entered without a name attached to it, so there's no shame, <laughs> then I think we can help people understand how important it is to get the mite levels back down. We started the Bee Squad to provide mentoring and to provide a service. I'll talk about that in a minute, but mostly to educate people about bees and our native bees and this landscaping piece. And so we started this program called Hive to Bottle. And the way we do it is the homeowner or the business purchases the bees and they purchase their own equipment. We can help them do that. We can help them get a permit because in Twin Cities area, many of the cities, you need a permit to keep bees. There are a lot of ordinances. And then 
we are the beekeepers. So they pay us to keep the bees, maintain the bees, and we give them the honey, of course. And our goal, of course, is to not put more and more bees in the Twin Cities. We're going to reach carrying capacity on how many colonies the cities can maintain, how many flowers are out there. Our goal is to have people plant more flowers. And so we're at corporate headquarters for Aveda and Target, Hirschfield's Paint, a lot of different places, a lot of garden centers, golf courses. And I'll give you an example of Town and Country Golf Club. This is very high-end private golf course. Um, they wanted a beehive because they wanted, people have green initiatives, you know, environmental initiatives, so they wanted a beehive. And so we put one on their service building roof, a flat roof, and the next day they told us, and by the way, we're going to spray 80 of our linden trees with imidacloprid. We're going to inject 80 of our linden, 80 of their linden trees, flowering linden trees, with imidacloprid, one of the neonicotinoids. For we said, well, you're, for what purpose did they want to? Spray? They wanted to inject their trees because Japanese beetles make holes in the leaves, and the golfers don't like holes in the leaves, I guess. Oh. And so they, it's a cosmetic use only. Doesn't the Japanese beetles don't hurt the trees? It's just cosmetic. So they did this thing, and their colony, whether it was from the insecticide or whether it was from some other reason, their colony didn't take a big dip. It almost died. It did come back. It was fine. But they, it scared them enough that they might have killed their bee colony, where they've changed their whole landscaping practices. They stopped using all cosmetic use. They plant flowers on the roughs. They write about their bees in the National Golf Digest. <laughs> and then, and they're setting an example for many. Target was the same way. 3M is doing the same thing. Everybody gets this beehive, it's kind of like their corporate mascot, and then they start asking, what do the bees eat? And it's such an opportunity to have them plant flowers for their bees. And they want to. It's really, it means a lot to them. So little by little, we're trying to change the landscape. So I'll end there. Um, that's the book if you want to read it. And I, I, I just want to leave time for questions.